Good morning, everyone. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today. On behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, I pay our respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. I'm Professor Neville Plint, Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at the University of Queensland, and I'd like to welcome you to today's seminar. In, the seminar is titled Indigenous Women's Participation in the Australian Mining Industry, and this will be delivered by Florence Drummond, CEO of Indigenous Women in Mining and Resources, and Joni Parmenter from SMI Centre for Social Responsibility in Mining. Florence is currently a visiting fellow at SMI and, and welcome, it's fantastic to have you at SMI. Um, and she and Joni have been working together on exploring the implications of corporate strategies that focus on gender for Indigenous women and highlight the needs of this group to provide opportunities for Indigenous women who choose to work in the sector. We're delighted to have Florence and Joni and, um, and, and, and really value and appreciate that you're able to be here and join us and be part of our activities for NADOC week um, this year. As ever, um, the participants online, if you could please put your questions into the Q&A button. Um, the temptation is always to put it into the chat button, but I'd ask you to please put it into the Q&A button. And then at the end, I'll put the questions to Florence and Joni um, and, and we can have a discussion after the seminar. So I'd like to hand over to you, Florence, and, um, and thank you very much. Morning, thank you, Neville. Uh, hello, everyone, and happy NADOC week. Thank you for joining us today. Firstly, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are today, uh, their elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Florence Drummond. I'm a Dara Wuthithi woman currently living on the West Coast on Noongabuja, and it's great to be here with you today. Uh, it truly has been an excellent experience here at UQ Sustainable Minerals Institute as a visiting fellow. Uh, firstly, to be writing our own story and co-authoring our narrative and sharing the valuable work we've been doing over the past few years through our Indigenous Women in Mining and Resources Network. Firstly, I, when I started to educate myself, about who was out there and what was there for Indigenous women and peoples in the sector. It was comforting to see people acknowledging and interested in our participation and, and writing about us. I remember wanting to meet these, these people to learn and to write with them to greater ensure that our story was heard from an Indigenous women's perspective in the industry. And a surreal moment this is today to be alongside you, Joni, um, and presenting together on our perspectives and experiences in this space. As Neville mentioned, over the past few months, I've spent some time with the Sustainable Minerals Institute and co-developed this seminar. We've structured the seminar with Joni beginning by providing an introduction to the topic and an overview of her research in the area. I will then provide some context in the second half of the seminar in, reflect in reflecting of my own experience in the industry and what we are hearing from our IWMRA network. Thank you, Florence. Uh, it really has been such a pleasure having you here. I, uh, in addition to Neville's and, and Florence's acknowledgement, I'd also like to acknowledge all of the Indigenous people whose land my research has been undertaken over the years. And this includes the Wanyi, Nalama, Yinjibandi, Bunjima and Gidget peoples. And uh, just a warning to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may have joined us, we will be showing a few historical images of people who are now deceased. Despite women having been involved and uh, certainly impacted by mining activities, the industry continues to be conceptualised as a male domain. The prevailing view in the literature is that women are more adversely impacted by mining than men, and this is largely due to women being excluded from negotiations and access to benefits such as employment. In some contexts, this exclusion of women in agreement making processes has been justified by local men and mining company representatives as well uh, as adhering to local custom, allowing for women to be ignored while the company positions themselves as culturally sensitive. 
This isn't always the case. And in Australia and Canada, for example, Indigenous women have played a central role in negotiating land use agreements. Uh, and, and many of these women also chair or, or co-chair the trusts created by these agreements and are also members of implementation committees. Non-government organisations have also concluded that the industry often create or exacerbate existing gender inequalities, while entrenched gender bias prevent women's participation. In recent years, the industry has increased its focus on gender as a way to improve their social performance. For example, some companies have made commitments to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, one of which is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Another development have been an increase in advocacy groups for Indigenous women, uh, and there's also uh, a number of spe women-specific mining associations um, for example, the one that, that Florence has uh, founded, IWIMRA, which uh, you'll hear more about shortly. There isn't really a lot of research on Indigenous women's experience working at industrial scale mines. Most of the global literature on Indigenous women and mining employment is focused on small scale or artisanal mining, where women <laughs> represent a larger percentage of the total workforce. When mining moves to large scale, the numbers of women tend to fall. And I, I've just put two examples here on this slide, one of PNG and one of Canada. Research in Papua New Guinea indicate that women have experienced sexual harassment and male backlash, and they have also been excluded, uh, despite their opposition, from occupying jobs as dump truck drivers uh, due to cultural beliefs that menstruating women would pollute the machinery consequently harming male drivers and the motor mechanics. Employment can also change existing gender roles within communities. In Canada, some Inuit women have become the primary income earner for their family, replacing the traditional role of men who provided for the family through hunting and fishing. This change in roles was reported to contribute to relationship tensions and sometimes violence. And just to give you a, a couple of examples of, of gendered practices at Australian mine sites, this one is uh, from Rio Tinto's Argyle Diamond Mine in Western Australia. Argyle is uh, located at Barramundi Gap. It's a place of great cultural significance to local Aboriginal people, especially women. It is the resting place for the female Barramundi creative dreaming being. And according to local Aboriginal people, the presence of coloured diamonds are evidence of her presence. Rough diamonds are said to be her scales and coloured diamonds are the transformation of her body fat. So those are the, the really highly prized uh, pink diamonds. And other colours are different internal organs. But the picture on the left here is of Barramundi Gap prior to mining and on the right that was taken in uh, 1985. And the picture down the bottom there is of local Aboriginal women performing the mantha welcoming ceremony for miners. This ceremony protects the miners from harm and is important for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous workers to participate. What's interesting here is that the numbers of Indigenous women employed at Argyle began to decline around the time the mine went underground. And uh, I was told that being underground would mean being physically closer to that site and many local Aboriginal women would refuse to do that. Another example is from Century Mine in Queensland, uh, owned by Zinefex at the time I undertook this research. In this region, red ochre is the domain of men and is important in male ceremonial contexts. It is considered offensive and dangerous for women to touch or be in close contact with. So at Century Mine, uh, at the request of traditional owners, mine management excluded all women from working in the pit when this material is uncovered. Uh, and they must work in another area that is said uh, to be harder work. While non-Indigenous women expressed frustration at this exclusion, the Indigenous women that I spoke to accepted these exclusion rules. Uh, and, and this indicates that Indigenous women's identification with their cultural identity and norms may take Precedent over, uh, precedence over concerns about gender equality. So there is 
There's clearly a lot of diversity and local understandings of gender and roles are highly likely to differ that of corporate understandings. So some of the, the key questions that we begin to explore in this seminar are listed here. And I'll just give you a few moments to, to, to look through those. These are, are very big questions. And as I said earlier, there's very little research that has looked at this. Uh, and so this seminar really just begins to explore them in the Australian context. Our approach is informed by intersectional theory and the work of Indigenous feminists who raise issues of colonialism, race and sexism and the synergy between them. When Western feminists were fighting oppression from men, Indigenous women were fighting many forms of oppression from the dominant society. So many Indigenous women, so for many Indi Indigenous women, race and class have historically come before issues of gender. Very little is known about how these overlapping oppressions create different experiences of mining work. Of course, there are different experiences amongst Indigenous women and uh, we're not intending to homogenise their experience in this seminar. My own posi positionality as a non-Indigenous woman uh, is different to that, of course, of my co-presenter and this seminar is, is a joint work and reciprocal learning exchange. Before I discuss some of the themes that have emerged from interviews that have, I've undertaken with Indigenous women working at Australian Mine Sites, I just wanted to give a, a very quick overview uh, of Indigenous women's participation. Indigenous women have a long history of working in mining in Australia. For example, in the Pilbara region, records indicate that Indigenous women were mining tin as early as 1906. They were particularly skilled at using uh, a traditional winnowing dish known as a yandy and were so central to the local mining company that a childcare camp allowed them to work full time. With the arrival of larger mining companies in the 60s and 70s, Indigenous participation declined. Indigenous people were initially excluded from employment opportunities at these new mines and their small scale mining activities could not compete with the technologies of these larger companies. If we fast forward to the last couple of decades, we see that very few Indigenous women worked in the sector in 2001, but uh, there's been a significant increase over time with the industry now the biggest industrial employer of Indigenous people in Australia. There has been little change in terms of women's representation in the Indigenous workforce between uh, 2011 and 2016. This stagnation at a time when the industry has been the most proactive in promoting gender diversity is interesting. And one possible explanation is that the, the GFC and resulting job losses uh, were in roles traditionally occupied by females. There is very limited published Indigenous employment data available for uh, individual mines. So, you know, while most major companies publish the percentage of Indigenous employees, and also the percentage of all women in, in annual reports. Most do not report data on Indigenous women. Uh, there's also no disaggregation for job roles or whether or not the employees uh, fly and fly out or live locally. This, the implications of this, of course, is that uh, if there are any policies or programs that target this demographic, the success or otherwise can't be managed, uh, measured rather. Employment data I recently analysed as part of a study at Rio Tinto's iron ore operations in the Pilbara does shed some light on the profile of Indigenous women at an operational level. Rio Tinto are a major employer of Indigenous people in this region, employing almost 1,000 Indigenous people across their 16 operations. Indigenous women represent 22% of the Indigenous cohort and a larger percentage of the local workforce. They also had the highest voluntary turnover of any cohort at 7.9%. When we look at job roles, you can see that Indigenous employees are underrepresented in senior roles. And this means that they are also likely to be disproportionately impacted by the industry's shift to automation. 
Indigenous women dominate administration roles and there are no female supervisors or superintendents. In terms of industry responses, uh, the purpose of this diagram here is just to point out the potential invisibility of Indigenous women due to the current way in which industry agendas are framed. Lumping all inequalities under the same umbrella of inclusion and diversity does not necessarily acknowledge the special position of Indigenous people as owners of the land being mined. And further, Indigenous women represent the overlapping intersection of the gender diversity agenda and the agenda to increase Indigenous participation. So this also risks overlooking Indigenous women. Under this current framework, it's quite possible that non-Indigenous women and Indigenous men are unintentionally favoured for opportunities that may arise. In my research in Australia, I have not found any evidence of employment policies or strategies specific to Indigenous women uh, or any regular internal reporting for this cohort, with very few mining company sustainability reports disaggregating employment data on women. So uh, what has been the experience of Indigenous women working in mining in Australia? Uh, so Florence is going to speak more about this shortly. I'm just going to very uh, super quickly run through a couple of the high level themes that have emerged from my interviews that I've undertaken. Uh, so firstly, some of the issues may not be unique for Indigenous women and uh, experienced by non-Indigenous women as well, such as working in a male-dominated environment and a lack of childcare. However, these issues can be compounded for Indigenous women in Australia who are more likely than non-Indigenous women to bear children at a younger age, have larger families and caring responsibilities, come from socio-economically disadvantaged communities and experience both racism and sexism. I was told that there is a lot of pressure for Indigenous women to stay home with their kids. And here are a few quotes that demonstrate this point. I'll just read the first one only. There was just no question if I would go back to work after my kids. Absolutely not. My partner wouldn't have allowed it. His family wouldn't have allowed it. It just wasn't going to happen. This quote is from a woman who started work at the mine after her relationship ended and she felt more comfortable making that choice. The last quote uh, also points to another consistent theme that has emerged and that is about, uh, and from men and women I should say, is that there's a lack of career development and knowledge about what other opportunities may exist. Uh, th this is also supported by the quantitative data um, which I showed earlier where uh, very few Indigenous workers are in senior positions in the industry. Another theme is uh, the perception of a hierarchy on site where Indigenous women occupy the bottom position. Non-Indigenous men are at the top, followed by non-Indigenous women, Indigenous men, and lastly, Indigenous women. Again, I'll, I'll just read the first quote here. They don't take you seriously. They're not going to listen to a woman, especially a black woman. And uh, I've put three quotes in there, one in 2007, 2011, 2020, to show that this has been an issue for some time now. And it really supports the view of some Indigenous scholars who argue that Indigenous women view disadvantages of indigeneity and class above those of sex, and that Indigenous women are politi politically aligned with Indigenous men. Uh, this is changing, though, with new types of Indigenous feminisms emerging more recently. And lastly, uh, despite some of the challenges of working at a mine site, some women at the fly and fly out sites describe their experience as a form of respite from the pressure they face in their home communities. Again, I'll just read the first quote here. Uh, a lot of us care for family. When I'm at home, I'm a carer for my dad. So being here is a bit of respite in some ways. Some people will sort of have the same thing, looking after some of their elders that they're required to look after and taking on other people's kids as well, all sorts of stuff. Interestingly, no male Indigenous employees express similar views. Um, this is not to imply that work is easy, but rather uh, these sentiments emphasise the hectic nature of life at home and being on constant call to family, friends and relatives 
uh, is potentially more of an issue for women. This issue has also been raised by Canadian Indigenous workers. The work camp is considered a safe respite from problems in reservations, such as overcrowding and family stress. So that's a very high level summary of some of the issues that have emerged from my research. And I'll now hand over to Florence, uh, who'll speak about her own experience working in the industry and what industry might do to make the workplace more culturally safe for Indigenous women. Thank you, Florence. Amazing, thank you, Joni. I really love listening to that. Um, always so knowledgeable. So, um, so, so many of those findings really resonated with me as well in my own experience, uh, and also through the conversations that we've engaged with through our Ivor network. Uh, so, let's take a deeper dive through the lens of my story. Um, so, I was born on and raised on Thursday Island. So, for those who don't aren't familiar with Thursday Islanders or TI. Um, on that map, there's that very top red dot between Papua New Guinea and Queensland. Uh, the population, according to the 2016 census, was there's about 3,000 people that live on Thursday Island itself and about 4,500 people who live in the region. Uh, so we lived, so I was born and raised there. Uh, we lived in my grandfather's, uh, my, the house that my grandfather built. Um, I'm the oldest of eight children. Um, he, being of Malaysian and Aboriginal descent, always claimed his Malaysian heritage, uh, which gave him the privilege to earn a decent living through the pearling industry and eventually owning his own property. So the house that I'm talking about is the very far right on the bottom there. That's, that's the house, it's still just standing. Um, my mother's parents, however, pictured in the, uh, in the picture diagonal to that map, uh, both moving from the uh, outer islands were one of the early settlers to Tamwai town, which was the back of the island where the majority of people who were living there lived in housing commission houses. They were very strong Christian, uh, they were very strong Christians uh, as the Eastern islands were heavily influenced by the missionaries, uh, which was celebrated every year on July the 1st. This year marked the 150th anniversary of this occasion uh, but in saying this, our culture is still very strong and valued. Uh, the respect for relationships and the different roles that both men and women both play within the family and communities is still very important to us and essentially that we can, and it is essential that we continue to practice these beliefs. So my primary school years were spent on Thursday Island uh, where I was raised with my, with my extended families and my culture was part of my everyday learning and behavior. I was soon, soon sent away to boarding school in Brisbane for high school. Uh, and if those who, who don't know where Brisbane is, it's the second red dot further down on that map there. Uh, at this time, I, was up, I absolutely loved it so much as it was freedom to be my own person. This was very different from my role as the eldest girl child at home and the huge responsibilities I had with helping with cooking and cleaning duties while my brothers and sisters got to do all the fun things and play outside. That was my point of view. Anyway, uh, high school was very interesting. It was an international school where we had many different cultures, languages, and different looking people. It grew my awareness and expectations of what the wide world is like and built my resilience against racism. It was the most impressionable time of my learning and I'm grateful to have had this experience. The immersion into Western culture, which, is, which from my childhood was always seen to be better than ours, this was soon to become further reinforced on my travels back home again during the school holidays. Speaking more English, I experienced what I now understand as lateral violence by my old school friends and community members who thought that I, who thought that members about me thinking that I was better than them. This was certainly not the case. Reflecting back now, there was so much more that I missed out on and the passing of my grandparents marked an end of a chapter that I will never completely understand. Their age old wisdom was sacrificed in the search for better education in the Western context. It is this loss that has enabled me to truly understand and remain mindful as we continue to promote local talent pools, promote learning and the priority of understanding the complexities and importance of all of our family ties. Leaving school, I stayed in Brisbane. My parents by now had separated 
as dad dad was doing FIFO so that he could afford to send us away to school. Uh, at the age of 19, I took on the responsibility of raising my siblings, including one of my cousins. So there were six of them that came to stay with me. As they finished their high school and my brother, his apprenticeship, we, as they finished their high school and my brother, his apprenticeship. We lived in Logan, which is just south of Brisbane, uh, where there was regularly drugs and alcohol being introduced. And my partner at the time who grew increasingly violent over the six years we would remain together. Breaking this cycle was truly difficult because it was what I understood as a normal, because that was similar to how I was growing up, or how I was raised and for the communities and families around me. I've since learnt a lot about myself and continue to do so every single day. So fast forward five years and I'm now in Sunshine Weeper as an official machine operator. So drivers for me to join the industry was firstly that my grandmother was ill and I wanted to move closer to home. Uh, I was living in Melbourne at the time. Uh, the application process was of direct employment um, as I was not a traditional owner uh, to the area. So I left Cosmo Cosmopolitan Melbourne, bought a four-wheel drive and caravan and head north. I uh, lived in the carav car caravan park there for two years, which was an adventurous introduction to mining life. So just reflecting on, on a couple more of those photos there. <laughs> Thanks, <Jenny. laughs> Um, so the mid one there, um, it was uh, when we started to go to a few mining awards when we were in mining um, and meeting some of the other women from around Australia as well who were part of the network but were also doing amazing things in their communities but also as role models as well for their families, which was fantastic. Uh, the furthest on the right is when I went to New York uh, for the UNCSW, so the Commission of the Status of Women, which was an incredible experience and we really try and share that experience with a lot of our iWomera network members. Um, and then down the bottom there again, like I said earlier, that's the house that my grandfather built. And that photo was taken last year when we announced that to be top 100 of the most uh, global women influences in mining. So it was kind of pretty nice to bring that back home for, for that occasion. So that was good. Yeah, next slide, please, Judy, Judy. Excellent. So common issues identified on site. So like I said, I, I've worked in the industry for about eight years. Um, so I started to get, get to know a lot of the people, um, my, myself as an operator, but also a lot of other people as well who are in the industry. Um, it's so I started IWIMRA into the, the first four years of my mining career. Um, at that time, being a residential mine, I was actually, and I actually never wanted to progress as well. Um, really highlighting what Joni was saying before around the drivers for being in industry. Uh, I was happy making money, saving money and, and spending it well, which was good, but also something very different to what I was used to. Learned a lot about myself in industry and, the, and also the other people that I had around me, um, our own expectations and what I also wanted to be as well. Working in a remote location, I learned that I love seeing the sunrise and the full moon in the very dark sky. It was something very different and that I appreciated so much being away from the busyness of city life. So when we speak about cultural safety, I learned that being in the industry could afford the nicer things, uh, a lifestyle that was excessive. I often felt guilty that when I look, that when I would think about my family living in social, lower social economic circumstances to borderline poverty, the normal situation of overcrowded housing, quality housing, affordability of food and affordability of household bills, sharing cars, sharing money, was us looking after ourselves and not putting ourselves above anyone else. The mindset and expectations of communal con contribution is very common. In saying that, the only way that I could feel okay with myself with living such a lavish life was to ensure that I became a much bigger contributor to my family's expenses. However, it is definitely something that I battle with on a regular basis as I continue to build a life that is unbelievably, unbelievably abundant with opportunities that is a product of my own mindset of nothing is impossible. The one thing I did, this, did this like though was night shifts. The huge component to this was, and it's no secret that I'm scared of the dark. 
which is a common belief in my culture. The reason and the reason why is because even though I was living and working in a very Western world, mine and many other Indigenous people's spiritual and cultural beliefs are always with us. The belief that the spiritual world is very real and very active, and if we're not practicing respectful behaviors towards country where we work, that our spiritual safety is at risk. These practices govern and guide my own ideology about the country and respectful relationships with traditional owner groups and our old people who are still actively watching over the lands on which we live and operate. Traveling through mining regions, it was much more, it is with much more diligence that I ensure that I prioritize my, my cultural safety to keep me safe. Career development was something else that Joni uh, touched on previously. Um, this was probably the start of why I remember started and why this conversation started here. Um, what I did observe is that, or what I do know is that I spent a lot of time with the crew that I was with, um, and we do, 12 hour shifts, it's a very long time, day and night. Uh, and my work family became my, my own family. I started to learn more of who they were, what was important to them, what their family life was like and what they aspired to be. What I also came to observe was the workplace could be quite stagnant. To clarify that, I felt that there were limited opportunities for people to progress. So additionally, additional to what uh, Joni mentioned earlier were the elements around compounded responsibility and also the perceptions of hierarchy. Racism is still a huge barrier for us. Um, what we have in our control though is the platform to educate. Here we look at unpacking the terminology, understanding what this can look like in the workplace, based on our own and other people's experiences, and also tools and actions to raise the standard of what we will accept and expect in our workplaces. Leaning heavily on internal mechanisms such as diversity and inclusion employees or something similar, this is the component of the workplace that can assist in leading, leading this change and we continue to improve our workplace culture. Circling back to my experience, perhaps it was because we were living in a, a regional or residential town and that many people did not want to leave their roles or that organic attrition for staff was not as often as moving to a regional town is a huge commitment. My curiosity grew as I observed a lot of our traditional owners who, who we had on site still attain only one or two machine qualifications and on a, not a pathway to leadership. I remember a senior Indigenous woman from the workplace remarking, same problem, different woman leading it. Implying this is an old conversation, remembering, remembering the exhaustion in her voice of her own term in advocating for voice and visibility for Indigenous peoples in the sector. I started to care a lot more when this trend became obvious. And to be fair, I also started to look more, of these, look more for these similarities across operations and to understand the reasons why. This ushered in the rapid establishment of the Iwimura Social Network. Applying the, the gender lens. So like I said um, earlier, it was really, racism has been a really heavy load for us in terms of trying to identify some of the issues on site. We couldn't really see past that. Um, but it, it really did help when we started to apply this, this gender lens and lens and this thing called intersectionality. So this was definitely a welcome deep dive into my understanding of intersectionality. Uh, the biggest shift in my thinking was that it was okay to be different and that different people can belong to these different layers of definitions and that I belong somewhere. At the time, it was the huge alleviation of pressure on myself, finding myself leading this huge conversation of indigenous women in mining, because while I know and believe that I cannot speak for everyone's experiences, I now understand that we can all have access to a dialogue that can help us decipher our own intersectionality. Mindful how we introduce this language to our networks most, is most important, but we base it on the reasons why it is relevant to their daily life and their family commitments. This was a greater call to action to the purpose of Iwimra and certainly a stretch in our capacity in the business space. On the plus side, it now made real a pathway in which we can build towards structural conversations that we can have, lasting impressions, and not only ourselves, but to our extensive spheres of influence 
as Indigenous women as stakeholders in the industry. So a couple of points there that I'd like to point out is that uh, we started IWMRA um, from a women's perspective. Oh, just the next one, please, Joni. Uh, because it was culturally safe to us to speak from a woman's perspective, uh, even though that we identified a lot of these um, hurdles for both men and women, we could only start it from a women's perspective. Uh, Indigenous men that I know are actively supportive of, of women's on, on of us of women on site, um, but for us it was about remaining le relevant, finding solidarity as well with the conversation, so that we're not forgotten. So at that point, I'm really referring to uh, other women's groups that are in the industry. So really finding the similarities there and making a genu genuine connection to see where we can both fill the gaps in what we're trying to achieve. Compounded responsibilities we reflected on and also understanding what is cultural safety uh, and who is responsibility, who is responsible for it as well. The next slide, please, Dreaming. So about IWMRA, so we launched in 2017 as a Facebook group. Um, so our main purpose was to raise or is to raise a profile of Indigenous women in the mining and resources sector. Um, we really stand on three pillars there, so voice, visibility and community, because it's something that we feel very strongly towards, but something that's also very close to our cultural commitments as well. So voice, is, voice as in empowering women to share their stories, and activate what is important to them. Visibility, so leading by example is very important to us uh, because we're across Australia and of course now with our global friends, it's so important to us to continue to remain visible uh, and utilizing uh, our social media as well to continue to connect and learn more of each other. Um, with leading by example, we create the opportunity to show up um, it, and that's a huge factor for us in building trust more than anything amongst our network members. And of course, the old saying, you can't be what you can't see. So we definitely try to push in and be as, as high and as wide as possible. Um, community, so we definitely try and build a community as well. That's the, the, the really, the, the focal point, I suppose, of, of our purpose, uh, building a community for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women uh, in this sector for us to continue to, to know that we're there for each other. Uh, but more so now to really think about how can we share knowledge and inform best practice. Um, so our, our IWMRA champions and advisors span across Australia uh, and actively support and promote our network within the mining resources and construction sectors. Both Indigenous men and women from within these fields strongly support our network and understand the importance of amplify, amplifying our conversations and finding our seat at the table. Celebrating a recent significant step for us, um, we've now transitioned into a non-for-profit, which is amazing uh, and will soon systemize to realize our membership reach globally and with both women and men being part of our community. So that's a, a really exciting announcement, which is very cool. Um, next slide, please, Jamie. So throughout our whole journey today, uh, I've observed and obsessed what the landscape is like for Indigenous engagement, uh, how it was, how it is, and the opportunities to become best practice as well. Uh, with the con contribution of all stakeholders, and most importantly, with the cultural lens to ensure we're all making informed decisions. So with this slide here, we really wanted to think about, or I really wanted to show what we've done in terms of building leadership uh, capacity through participation. So our women grew very quickly and, and we grew um, with so much momentum behind it that we did a lot of international work very early on uh, in our time as well. Um, and the reason that we, we did do it more than anything was to participate and be, be visible, but more so to showcase to other women what is possible. So the map that's there back in 2019, we had a um, competition for women to join us uh, in the 2020 UNCSW, which was again, to be held in New York. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen because of COVID. But what I wanted to show there was there's a lot of women from around Australia that really participated in the, in the competition. So it really showed where our reach was, 
where influence was, but where other women were, were tuning in from as well to be part of IWIMRA. Um, the most important thing for us was really thinking about how can we make huge impact. So just going through a couple of those photos there uh, at the very top, if there's anyone here from Rio or know of Joanne Farrell, that was at her time when she was uh, still with Rio. Um, and that was at the time that I was an operator for, for Rio. So it was a very surreal experience to be um, sharing, you know, a cup of coffee with with the, the most senior officer in your in the organisation uh, when you were in Weeper, uh, a truckie. So that was very inspiring. Um, the picture below that, just quickly with that one. Um, so that was in Times Square as well in New York. Um, <laughs> that was when we were travelling back and COVID was taking over the world. Uh, Christina there, she was a transition officer for Juvenile Centre at the time, um, but her kids saw her on TV uh, and thought that she was a superstar. So she was just making so much impact with for people around her. Uh, in different spaces. So again, thinking about how influential we could be with uh, building women's confidence of, you know, and women on site as well. Uh, the two photos down the bottom there is when we traveled to Latin America, uh, we met with indigenous women within the mining sector, mining and extractive space from there as well, but also other women as well from uh, other parts of, of the industry. So we met with people from government, we met with counselors, and we also had breakfast with the vice president of the country which is which is actually very you know really impressive and very impactful and inspiring when we're sharing these stories and experiences with other women who are working on site in our remote and rural locations so the, the couple of things that we were really trying to address through participation uh, is really try to uh, help our women on site our men on site think about the things that are really um, going to to impact us so if we think about uh, automation, uh, racism, and also sexual harassment as well, uh, they're very uh, important and direct impacts that are impacting Indigenous women on site. Uh, and also understanding our indirect impacts as well and how we can start to address that. So when, when we hear the words, you know, SDGs and ESG and intersectionality, how does that, how does that impact us and should we care and why should we care? Um, so really thinking about some education tools around people learning more about that. Um, and just sharing quickly the quote um, we, from that competition there, we had one, uh, one of the girls come away with us. She wanted all expenses paid for a trip. Um, but this, is, this was her response. Uh, the, the question was, why would, coming, why would coming to New York or how would that impact you? Uh, she wrote, it would, be, it would allow me to play a role in encouraging remote Indigenous women to reach bigger in their goals to succeed in their career. So that was her submission. So that's excellent. Uh, yes, next slide, please. So from us, that was a really, um, I guess, brief overview of, of my experience and also what's become of it in terms of building IWIMRA and shaping IWIMRA. Uh, but what we found as well is a few things that we've worked with companies with and identified within our network that could really help build a culturally safe mind site. Uh, as Joni said earlier, some of the, the compounded um, hurdles were not specific to Indigenous women. Uh, so what we really tried to do was partner with other associations that are already established, but could also help as well with us reaching our goals. Uh, the best thing I could say about the inclusion diversity co conversation is that there's a lot more support and awareness and open-mindedness with a lot of people out there. So it's in the much more um, fluid conversation to, to have with other people. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to grow together. Um, so these are a couple of points. So employ and development, employ and develop Indigenous employees into leadership roles. Uh, that's hugely impactful uh, with that one there. And it can really give you a cultural lens, especially at board level, especially at man, uh, management and decision-making level as well. Uh, you can't be what you can't see. That can certainly help with that. Uh, supplement learning with mentoring and encourage two-way learning. Uh, it's always a two-way learning in terms of learning about culture, um, in terms of learning how to communicate that most effectively is probably one thing that you can benefit with um, in the age of digitalization. Uh, it's really accessible to have mentors across the globe, which is something that's very inspiring. Uh, promote cross-cultural learning. There's a couple more points to that on the next page. 
Uh, but other things as well that was uh, gender specific, we thought about um, offering flexible rosters. So when we think about our responsibilities as Indigenous women in terms of our family, that could heal, really uh, assist us in, in helping us manage our families, but also people to care with us for our families. Uh, mentioning earlier, um, finding other people or networks that are out there that are already doing things uh, in the way forward in terms of gender diversity and equality. Um, we recently partnered with NAWO. Um, so we're doing some fantastic work with them and looking forward to some, some better things there. Uh, and of course, from a, from a site or business perspective, zero tolerance uh, for racism and sexual harassment. Cool, next slide. Thank you, yep. and this is the last slide. It's just a couple more points there that we can really think about in terms of uh, touch, touch points, but also creating a culturally safe mindset as well. Um, creating a cultural calendar to identify key dates, for example, NADOC week this week, but also think about how do we schedule a, a, a regular welcome to country so that really would help with a lot of our cult cultural and spiritual um, beliefs as well, but also just to help us feel um, that we, you know, that we can, can be there comfortably. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags to be flown on site as well. And also <laughs> something that's really exciting if anyone's been flying lately, uh, collaborating with partner services. So if you use any of the airlines and they've done an acknowledgement to country uh, on descent, that's something that's really uh, heartwarming, but also provides consistent education to all of our, our entire workforce really to, to give people um, to, you know, to give people identity, but also just to feel feel pretty, you know, proud in, in a few things there as well. So I think that is it for now, Joni, and I'll leave some time for, for questions, but thank you all for listening and I'll hand it back to Neville. All right, Joni and Florence, thank you very much for a, a very, very interesting presentation. Um, and greatly appreciate the personal insights. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I think you may have answered some of these as you went along, but we'll ask them and maybe you can just add a little bit of extra context to them. Um, so we've got one here. Um, did the cultural significance of the Argyle Diamond Mine prevent Aboriginal women from working there prior to the mine shifting to underground? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I guess it may have prevented both men and women from working at the mine site um, at all. And, and I, don't, I don't have any data on that because I only spoke to um, Indigenous people who obviously made that choice to work there. Um, but given many, I do know that many local Aboriginal people did work there over time. In fact, Argyle is one of the leading mines in Australia in terms of um, numbers of Indigenous employees and, and local employees. Um, so what I did here about the, the Mantha ceremony is that it acted to protect workers. So as long as men and women participated in that ceremony, they felt comfortable working at the mine. So it was only really um, when it un went underground that it was you know, physically closer to that site that it was an issue. And also to you know, for many Indigenous employees who come from other parts of Australia um, and they're working on somebody else's country, they can feel very conflicted working there. So uh, it's a really good opportunity to have traditional owners welcome, uh, not just the non-Indigenous workforce, but, but Aboriginal people from other parts of the country. And um, I have to say it's the month of ceremony, from what I've seen, it's one of the best examples of, of, of doing that in Australia. Right. Um, Florence, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I know. I agree with that and definitely echo that the cultural safety is a huge factor for Indigenous peoples working on other people's country. All right, fantastic. Um, I do notice that there, there are a couple of um, hands that have been raised and a couple of questions or comments in the chat box. If I could ask you, please, just to pop that into the Q&A. We've got about eight questions online, and I'll just work through that, and I would really like to, to get to everybody if we can in the next, next 10 minutes. All right, next question is, um, what do you think would be the best thing to do 
to bring a more solidarity system for Indigenous women to feel more supported both on-site and, I suppose, off-site. Um, what interventions do you think can be implemented by mining companies to help Indigenous women? Uh, definitely. Well, I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> um, so definitely a few things for us is uh, communication and education is our very first step. So how do we communicate things um, for us around what the issue, not the issues, but the challenges that we're trying to address? We really had to educate around what we're actually talking about. You know, what's important to industry? Where's the link between Indigenous women and Indigenous engagement? What does this social performance look like? Um, so it's, it's highly important that we start to re-educate ourselves around understanding what we're actually talking about. Um, one of the things that we're aiming for with IWIMRA is um, ensuring or sponsoring 10 people per year to undertake the AICD course, um, just to help people with pathways to uh, directorship uh, level. Okay. Um, Joni, do I... I have to if you if you'd like to comment as well, just pop your hand up. Otherwise, I'm going to be bouncing backwards and forwards. I just want to make sure we get comments from both of you, if possible. Or yeah, I well, I think I think that there's a lot of initiatives that industry can do, and it's not necessarily specifically for women. There's a lot of initiatives that will help both Indigenous men and women. It's just about having that gender lens, and you know, making sure that you are promoting both Indigenous women and Indigenous men, for example. And it's very hard to do that when you don't. Uh, report on data for Indigenous women. You, you can't. You don't have any visibility of that. So um, that that's one point. But and Florence mentioned some of the in her slides some of the things that could be done for Indigenous women more specifically, like flex, flexible leave. And there's also things uh, again that would uh, benefit men as well. And perhaps you know when you recruit and you have an intake of Aboriginal workers. You do that in a group. You might want to do that a group of women at a time. Uh, Florence, you think that would be a good idea? Same with men. Um, so that because we know that support by uh, other Aboriginal people on site is, is one of the things that really keeps people around. All right. I think you, you might have touched on the next question, um, but I, I'm going to ask it anyway because it's got a, a slight nuance to it that I think would be really valuable to discuss. Uh, what are the main initiatives mining companies should undertake to improve the experiences of women in mining? Yeah, good, good question. Um, definitely a welcome to country. I think that that helps a lot of people in many different ways because there's a lot of um, spiritual activity or a lot of things that, are, that impact us um, that uh, non-Indigenous or Western medicine or, or culture may not understand. So having that relationship with tr traditional owners uh, on site is definitely of high importance. Um, and thinking about as well having uh, either liaison offices or people that they could go to talk to in terms of mentoring or some kind of support there as well. Um, but, of course, if we had Indigenous people in leadership, that would really help um, help help the structure and the flow of the conversation in the first place. Joey, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, well, I'll just add that I think it's important too that not just to have a, you don't necessarily have to have a generic approach um, to these things. I think understanding the local context is really important. Uh, you know, cultures will vary across Australia as they will internationally, of course. So you really, it's really important to understand that local context, understand how it's gendered, what are the gender ro gender roles in that local community, um, because that will inform your initiatives. Um, to, to make sure that they're successful. All right, I'm going to pick up on um, a, a similar sort of um, direction. And this one is really around, um, Joni, in your presentation, you mentioned that Indigenous turnover is higher for Indigenous women than other groups. Um, do you have any insights as to why? It was slightly higher, uh, only by one or two. 2%, I think, from memory, but um, unfortunately there wasn't any exit interview data available to be able to, to look at that in detail. Uh, but one, what I can say is that um, what is potentially more interesting, interesting is that when I looked at the data over time, so at what, at what you know, how, how long they'd been working there and when they left, um, I found that turnover was almost double for Indigenous employees within the first year, more than double that, that's compared to the non-Indigenous workforce. So I think it was around almost 20% from memory. Um, 
So this really indicates that the employment experience uh, for the first year, you know, a lot of support is needed during that first year. And for some Aboriginal people, for example, it could be their first mainstream experience of work, let alone in mining, which we know is very different kind of place to work. Um, so really dedicated support during the first year is needed. And also before they start work too, if you've got uh, a local group of Aboriginal people starting um, mining, that you know, there's things like work ready programs that are are needed uh, to, to and, and they can start in a group again so it's culturally safe it can be tailored for the industry and it can make sure that they are prepared to enter and and therefore more likely to stay longer than that first year and certainly once they do stay longer than a year we know that uh, they stay for you know a very long time with the company as well right Florence did you have any comments no I thought that was that was good thanks Tony um, I'm going to um, jump around a little bit and um, a very interesting question here. Um, and it's really asking, do you have any insights into the differences and the challenges facing Indigenous women in the mining sector in Australia versus South America? Uh, Florence, I know you had a recent trip to South America. You might have something to say about this, but... Um, Really, as I said, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge of, of, of large-scale mines in South America. There's really, as I said earlier, really little literature about this. So uh, I think, you know, it's, a, it's a, a space where a lot of research needs to be done in this area. Um, but, but Florence, uh, yeah, did you want to comment on issues identified in your recent travel? Yeah, definitely. So the, the biggest thing that we found was there was a huge gender challenge in, in South America as opposed to here in Australia um, in saying that from an Indigenous, or from my perspective as an Indigenous woman in the industry, um, they were challenged more um, from gender, whereas here it's racism was a bigger thing for us that in terms of us staying in the industry or one of our biggest challenges is racism as opposed to gender inequality. Um and I think that was that was probably the biggest one. Oh yes, also the second one: history of artisanal mining over in uh, South America is much more well known as opposed to here in Australia, where we didn't know. You know, we don't know that Aboriginal women were mining tin in the Pilbara. So we our education around our history and involvement with mining is is different. Okay, I've got time for two more questions, and I think we've got about seven or eight more that we haven't got to. So. For those that have posted questions, um, we'll pick those up and we'll we'll come back to you and, and answer those. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit selfish here and ask um, just two questions um, out of this. And the one is, um, we'd love to hear your advice on how we can get more young Indigenous women to get interested in mining-related disciplines and then study them at university. Any advice for us? That's very exciting. Um, definitely where your talent pools are um, and the communication that you've got, like what, what your advertising is, is towards these women. Like I know when I went away and I lived away, I missed my family heaps. You know, I missed my family a lot and that was a huge factor in bringing me back home. Um, so thinking about the supports that they have when they do come to site uh, and, and perhaps maybe thinking about it like a mine site where you've got support officers, when you've got uh, communication around what the expectations are as well. Um, I think that would really help. And think about the different languages that people have as well. That's a barrier. All right, thank, thank you very much. And then um, final question, and, and I'm glad somebody posted this one. I, I didn't make this up, but I'd love to know. And what could SMI do to support the women of your organisation, Iwimra? Ah, thank you. That's a beautiful question. Um, definitely more experiences like this. There's, there's a lot of amazing women throughout our network that are interested in, in uni or developing their um, their professional space as well. You know, mining being a very traditional industry, it really appreciates having people with, with um, education to really progress as well. I think that's complimentary. But thank you so much. But opportunities like this to many other women, hugely appreciated. Fantastic. Well, Joni and Florence, thank you very much. We've um, used our hour, and I know there are lots of lot more questions, 
I'm hoping those that have those questions will join us for tea um, downstairs and we look forward to catching up. And to everybody online, thank you very much for your attendance and look forward to seeing you at the next Tuesday SMR seminar. Thank you very much.